We're looking at the Beatitudes, and I'm sharing on a series I call The Blessed Life. The Beatitude we're examining tonight is Matthew, the 8th chapter, and verse 8. Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It's a very interesting statement, and uh, many times we misunderstand it because we actually interpret it as we read it, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall die and go to heaven. Now, that's true, but that's not what this verse says. This verse says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, I want to emphasize there was three ways that this word pure was used in the New Testament. You understand that the New Testament was written in the Greek language, and the Greek language was very uh, picky about it. It had different definitions for different words. And for instance, this word pure, it's translated different ways. One of the ways it's translated is to be innocent, to be innocent, like a baby. Um, there's nothing that's more innocent than a baby in this life. Someone has well said that they are so pure, so innocent, because they just got here. They just arrived, and I think there's some truth to that. So this is one of the ways that this word is translated. Blessed are the innocent in heart, for they shall see God. Another way that this word is used is clean, and that's the way I'm emphasizing tonight. Blessed are the clean. Clean, like a sterilized dish, a, a dish that's been washed in a, a scalding hot water that's killed all the germs and bacteria. That is one of the ways that this word is used. So Jesus said, blessed are the clean, for they shall see God. And then a third way that this word is used is the word genuine. Pure is the way we usually say it, but uh, I use the illustration here of some bars of gold that are 999.9% pure. That's as pure as we can purify it. And so it literally means free from any mixture. So these are the three main ways that this word is used for Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart. Now, let's examine, first of all, the first word, innocent, innocent. And the statement I'm going to connect with that is, the eyes of our heart are the windows of our soul. Now, that's an important statement. I believe it to be very true. The eyes of our heart are the windows of our soul. And that's why Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What you see is determined by your heart. So the eyes of our soul, it actually comes through our heart. The eyes of our heart are the windows of our soul. Everyone to have a relationship with God must have what is called a born again or born from above experience. Here in John, the third chapter, in verse 3, Jesus said, he's talking to one of the religious leaders, Nicodemus by name, and he says to him, you must be born again or born of God. Of course, Nicodemus is thinking in physical terms, and he said, how is that possible that a grown man can be born again? But Jesus was speaking about a spiritual birth, a spiritual birth. And it's the only way for us to have a relationship with God. We must be born of God. And the, the best illustration is like a new baby, born like a baby. Remember where Jesus said to his disciples in the book of Matthew, he said, except you repent and become like a little child, not a big child, not after they get big enough, you know, to discover their own will, but the little child child. Everyone must start the same way. We must learn to look at life with the innocence of a child. I love to be around little children. They are so free from any guilt, any kind of agendas. That's why a little child can look at me and say, boy, you sure are fat. 
And it's not offensive at all because they're just obvious, speaking the obvious, you know, out of a pure heart. Now, if you do that, it might offend me because you may have an agenda that's going there. But the little child has no agenda. They are pure in heart or they are innocent. And so we all, we all have to deal with this. For instance, every one of us have two voices, two voices. We have a verbal voice that I'm using right now, and yet... Those that are in communication tell us that 80% of communication is nonverbal. It's an action voice, an action voice. When our verbal voice doesn't match the action voice, it's the action voice that's the true voice. That's why when someone is smiling at you, but their eyes don't smile, don't believe it. They're giving you a lie there. The, the action voice is the true voice. It's more than a cliche. Actions speak louder than words. That is a true statement. And so every one of us have to deal with this, and we must deal with the purity of our heart to get rid of our agendas. One of the greatest compliments that was ever given to me was by another minister that looked at me and said, Dale, in all the meetings that I have been with you, you have never come to the meeting with a hidden agenda. To me, that was the highest of compliments because we've got to keep our hearts pure, keep our hearts innocent. Now, if the eyes of our heart are the windows of our soul, here's the second thing I want to talk about. And it's the word clean. That's what we're using tonight. Blessed are the clean, those that are in us, those that are pure, those that have no mixture, no contamination in their spirit, in their soul. Clean, dirty windows contaminate our vision. Just as in the natural, if you've got dirty windows, it's very difficult to see clearly through those windows. I, I remember one of my friends was writing with a gentleman that, oh my, he had bugs splattered all over his windshield. You could hardly see out. And, and they stopped to gas up, and he grabs uh, the, the cloth to start cleaning off the bugs off of the windshield. And then the, the man saying, oh, no, 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 don't touch that, said, it, it bothers me when I can see the road that clearly. Uh, it bothers me when I can't see clearly. Dirty windows contaminate our vision, what we see. Now here's a verse of scripture. I want to take time to read this verse. If our heart is pure, then we see what God is doing. Let's take a moment and let's read this verse of scripture found in the book of Titus. Titus, the first chapter. Let me get my reference here. Titus, the first chapter in verse 15 and verse 16. He's talking about the purity of our heart. Listen, th th these are powerful words. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Those are extremely powerful words. To those that are pure, all things are pure. That's why Jesus said, the pure in heart will see God. But to those that they, are, they do not have a pure heart, he said their conscience is defiled. Now, we're using the illustration of Joseph, and that's what we see with Joseph and his brothers. See, if our heart is impure, we see what the devil, what people are doing 
rather than what God is doing. The purity of your heart determines what you see. Blessed are the clean, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, in referencing Joseph, let me use this illustration. When someone responds negatively to what normally is good news, it shows he has a defiled conscience. For instance, with Joseph and his brothers, when his brothers came to Egypt to receive corn to eat, Joseph had his men put their money back in their feed sacks. They don't know the money's there, so when they get to their first camp to feed the animals and they open up the bag of grain, there's a sack of money in the sack of feed. What was their response? What, what would be your response if you just found a few gold coins or a few silver coins? I, I, it, it would be good news, not to these men. When these men said it, saw it, the Bible said they were terrified. And they said, what is this that God has done to us? Then when they got home and they opened up all the bags of grain, they found out their money was in every sack of grain. And the Bible said they were greatly afraid. Now what does that show? It shows they have a defiled conscience, that their conscience was not pure. And because their conscience was not pure, what should have been good news becomes terrifying news to them. What is this that God is doing to us? It's because of the defiled conscience. Now, here is a good verse of scripture in 1 Timothy 1 and 5. He said, this should be our goal as Christians. This is what we, our objective, what we're trying to accomplish. It should be, first of all, love out of a pure heart. There's our word again. Love out of a pure heart. That should be our objective as a Christian. The second word that he uses, he says, uh, and a good conscience. A good conscience. When he talks about conscience, the word conscience literally means an inner knowing. In other words, nobody else knows what's going on inside you, but you and God. You know what's going on. This inner knowing is your conscience. And he said it should be a good conscience. It refers to inner secrets, things that nobody else knows anything about, just that's between us and God. So he said this should be our objective as a Christian, love out of a pure heart, a good conscience, and then what he called sincere faith. Sincere. A faith that's not faked, in other words. Sincere. The, the word sincere was a, a, a Greek word that was used in that culture that literally meant no wax, without wax. Now, where this come from, uh, they, they sold a lot of pottery for their drinking vessels, for mm, transporting water. There are all kinds of purposes that they used the clay pots. Dishonest merchants would use wax to cover the cracks in the clay pot. That way, you, you couldn't tell it. They would mix it with the, the dust, the clay dust, and uh, you could not tell that it was a broken vessel or it had a flaw in it because the wax covered it up. So honest merchants would put up this sign and say, sincere, which literally meant no wax. We're not waxing our clay pots. Of course, the problem with waxing the clay pot is it's not going to stay that way. You may wax it, but wait. It won't handle the pressure. Time, heat, these things always will expose the crack in the pot. Now that's what Paul was saying. Our goal as a Christian should be to have a sincere faith, a faith that's not waxed, a faith that we're not putting on a show, a faith that we're not trying to impress anyone. It's the real deal.
So he said, this is our objective as believers. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, those that are clean, because they shall see God. Now, let me talk about the third area. The third area, we talked about being innocent, being clean. Let's talk about being genuine, like the pure gold, the bar of gold that has been refined and purified as, as much as is possible to purify it. Pure hearts focus on one thing. In other words, there is no mixture there, just one thing. Here's a good verse of scripture. Jesus in Matthew, the sixth chapter, says this. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, if your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. Now, he's connecting this with what he had said. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Remember, the window of your heart is... The mirror of your soul, that's what lets the light in. Now, this word Jesus uses, if the light, of the, the, the light of the body is the eye. Therefore, if your eye is good, the word good can also be translated and is translated in, for instance, I'm quoting here from the New King James Version, but in the King James it says, if your eye is single, single. Other translations use the word clear here. But what he's talking about, there must be no mixture in our souls. This is one of the things that I have discovered so many people have uh, an agenda or they have a, uh, an image they've got to keep up. They've got to pretend. They're always trying to make you believe something that and just the, the way they're trying, they try too hard and it, it convinces us they're hiding something. The, the, you know, for instance, the thing that bothers me about perfect people is I'm always suspicious they're trying to hide something because I know there is no such thing as perfect people. We are all just people. And yet there are those that are always pushing their agenda and trying to impress us. This is what Jesus is warning about. And he goes on to say, no man can serve two masters. It doesn't matter what those masters are. To try to serve two masters brings confusion. There's a mixture in your soul. And, and you're trying to be this, and then you're trying to be that. And the problem is sometimes you can't remember which one you're supposed to be now. And don't live that way. Blessed are the pure in heart. Those that are genuine, that aren't trying to impress anyone with their faith. This, this is another way of saying this is we're out of harmony with God and others. I used to play the guitar quite often, and, uh, and we used it a lot in our evangelistic efforts. Uh, have you ever noticed guitar players have to tune the guitar quite frequently. This is what happens to our souls. Our souls get out of tune. Just the daily use, just playing the guitar can get it out of tune, and you have to do the fine tuning to keep everything in harmony. This is, should be our goal as Christians. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Keep your soul in harmony with God and others. Don't live a life of pretense. Another way of expressing this that I, I found from the book of Song of Solomon. In Song of Solomon, he is always addressing her as my dove, my dove. That's his favorite word uh, when speaking to his lover, my dove. She called him my dear. Dear was the word that she used, but he refers to the dove. Now, here's what I discovered. The dove's eye is not only beautiful, but the dove's eye can only focus on one object at a time. One object at a time. A good illustration of this is a young couple that is so much in love with each other, say it's their wedding day. 
Uh, they're not looking at all the guests. All they will glance at everybody, but their eyes keep going back to their sweetheart, to their lover. They have eyes only for their lover. This is what he is saying. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What a tragedy did I notice, and if this can happen to any one of us, that we can lose our vision of God and we begin to look at people. We begin to look at even the devil. We start seeing all kinds of things other than seeing what God is doing. The pure in heart see God. Pure hearts. They, they have this vision of God. Let's go back to the story of Joseph again. In the story of Joseph, when Joseph revealed himself to his brothers in Genesis, the 45th chapter, it's a very moving story. Uh, when he does, the brothers are just terrified. They are literally speechless. They don't know anything to say because their guilt has been found out. Joseph is not dead. He's alive, prime minister of Egypt. Question is, how did he get here? Well, obviously, somebody sold him. Somebody sent him there. And uh, here he is in Egypt ruling, and, and they are terrified. Joseph calls his brothers, and he said, come near to me. And he speaks to them, and he says, so you thought you were doing evil against me. But God meant it for good. It was not you that sent me here, but God that sent me. Now, we, we, we well understand that his brothers were actually involved in that process of selling him as a slave. Uh, I, I'm reminded of the lady that, you know, she, she was praying this before air, air conditioning and she's praying loud and, and the boys in the neighborhood hear her praying for food. Oh God, send me some food, you know. I'm, and they, they get up the eye, let's go get something. They run down the store, they bought some food and brought it in a sack and put it on her doorstep and knocked on the door and then ran to hide. And she comes and opens the door and, uh, and there's a sack of food and she burst out into spontaneous praise. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you. And these boys come laughing out from behind their hiding places and saying it wasn't Jesus that did it we're the ones that went and got that food she looked at him and she said it was Jesus that got it even if he sent the devil to fetch it <laughs> I love that story because uh, sometimes it's people doing us wrong but they don't realize they are a part of the bigger picture that's what Joseph is seeing Joseph is not looking at what his brothers did, what they said. He's not looking. He's looking at the big picture, the God picture. Now, if you have a pure heart, you're able to do that. If you have a defiled conscience, then you remember what they said. You remember what they did, and you focus on the details. Joseph saw the big picture. Impure hearts always focus on the things that are wrong rather than seeing the big picture. I want a pure heart. I want a pure heart. I, that, that, that is, it's crucial to living the Christian life. I've learned by experience, you can't live the Christian life watching people. You've got to keep your eyes on God. So what Joseph was seeing, Joseph was seeing the big picture. It was God that sent me here. Years later, after Joseph and his brothers, their father, Jacob, died. When Jacob died, his brothers again became terrified. Notice they're still dealing with this defiled conscience. And they're saying, now that dad's dead, Joseph will get even. He'll get vengeance against us. The Bible said when Joseph heard those words, he broke down and he cried. And he said, I know you intended it for evil, but God meant it for good that he might save alive many people as it is this day. And he spoke kindly to them. How could he do that? Because his heart was pure. 
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Joseph doesn't see the evil they did. He doesn't see what the devil tried to do. No, 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 no. He sees the big picture. And that's what I challenge you. Get the big picture. Get a pure heart. Purity of heart is one of the most essential things in life. In the book of Proverbs, the wise man said, keep your heart with all diligence because out of it, out of your heart, proceeds the issues of life. This is what Joseph has. And he said, am I in the place of God? In other words, there's never a place for us to play like we are God. It's one of the warnings that's given to us in the book of, of Romans where he says, vengeance belongs to the Lord. Anytime that we try to act vengeance and try to get vengeance upon someone, we're playing like we are God. And the truth is, none of us are God. We're not qualified for that. So let's get a pure heart, a pure heart. Matthew, the 18th chapter, Peter approached Jesus and he knew he's talking to the Lord. And so he said to him, Master, if, if my brother sins against me seven times in one day, should I forgive him seven times? Now, Peter's trying to make himself look good, not bad, but basically he made two mistakes. Number one, never put a limit on forgiveness, and that's what Jesus told him. Not seven times, but 70 times seven. In other words, don't put a limit on forgiveness because sooner or later we will need it ourselves. The second thing that, he, that I noticed in this story is, why is it that Peter is thinking it will be his brother that will need the help? No, the truth is all of us will need it sooner or later. And Jesus is saying, you're going to need forgiveness. See, we tend to think that we can fix things up. We can't. Jesus plainly said in this story, he was not able to pay. You don't have the resources to do it. So you've got to trust God, trust his forgiveness. The only way we can be saved is by grace. Salvation is only possible through grace because we're all bankrupt before God. And so I emphasize what Jesus said again. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those that have a clean heart, an innocent heart, a genuine heart, because they shall see God. In other words, what we see reveals our heart. May God bless you.